It is an honor and a pleasure for me to have been asked to share this brief overview of the life and ministry of my grandparents, T. Ernest and Elizabeth Wilson. From the time that he left Belfast in 1923, my grandfather kept a journal which became the basis for his autobiographical book, Angola Beloved, that was published in 1967 by Lawaza Brothers. Grandpa gave me a copy of the book for Christmas in 1982. We are glad that Gospel Folio Press reprinted the book in 2007, and if nothing else, I hope that this presentation will encourage another generation of young Christians to read his story of God's faithfulness and be challenged to step out in service for the Lord in simple dependence upon him. Angola is located on the west coast of Central Africa. Ernest Wilson was born in Belfast in May of 1902, and he was born again in May of 1918 in a little wooden hall on Fulton Street in Belfast. Just a month later, he was baptized and received into fellowship in the assembly that meets at Donegal Road Gospel Hall. And then it was in October of 1923 that he was commended to God's grace by Donegal Road Gospel Hall at just 21 years of age. Ernest grew up reading biographies of missionaries like David Livingston, Fred Stanley Arnott, and Mary Slessor. Afterward, he was saved. He was advised to get a good Bible and a good alarm clock. I remember him saying one time, someone was asking him how he was able to get up so early in the morning, and he said, well, when the alarm clock goes off, I reach across, I grab the covers, I pull them aside, swing my feet around, put my feet on the floor, and stand up, and I'm up for the day. And he gave himself in those early years of his Christian life uh, to reading God's Word, to studying God's Word, uh, while serving his five-year apprenticeship at Harland and Wolf Shipyard. Uh, his dinner times were spent there studying the scriptures with a group of godly men at the shipyard. His Saturday afternoons in the summer were spent with other keen believers evangelizing across counties Antrim and Down. He was deeply impacted by reading about the faith and convictions of people like Hudson Taylor and George Mueller. In 1921, Fred Lane, an English missionary, came to Belfast and gave a report on the unevangelized north of Angola. Ernest was deeply burdened by this report, and after three years of prayer and correspondence with Mr. Lane, he spoke with the elders of the assembly, who extended to him the right hand of fellowship and commended him to the grace of God. This is his letter of commendation, written on the 10th of October, 1923. In his book, Angola Beloved, he wrote, I left Ireland in October, 1923, with a third-class ticket to take me as far as Lisbon in Portugal but with no passage money beyond that, no supplies, and without a promise of support from anyone. I felt I wanted to simply trust God from day to day and try honestly to put into practice the principles I had learned from the Bible. I wanted to satisfy myself whether the principle of simple faith in God would work or not. After over 40 years of testing and varied experience, I can gladly testify that it does. So he arrived in Portugal in October of 1923 for 10 months of language study. Then in 1924, he sailed from Lisbon to the port city of Lobito in Angola, right on the coast there. When I landed in Lobito, he said, in 1924, it was still undeveloped. There was only one primitive hotel infested with bugs and cockroaches and no modern plumbing. I slept on a table the two nights there. It would have been more comfortable sleeping on the warm sand outside. But here at last I had my feet on African soil, the ambitions of many years realized. As I thought of the unknown future in the interior of Africa, I prayed, O oh Lord, give me three years and I will be satisfied. Having arrived in Lobido, he then traveled on to Chilanda Mission Station in the BA region of the country, then on to Capango Mission Station, and then finally moved to Holando Mission Station in BA, where he served the next 18 months while learning the Umbundu language. He says four things are necessary in learning a language. First of all, to have a good working knowledge of the grammar of one's own language. It seems foolish for one to attempt to master a foreign tongue when one doesn't know his own. Secondly, it is important to have a good musical ear to distinguish differences in tone. A deaf person would have difficulty in mastering a language. Thirdly, one must have a good memory to retain what he hears. Fourthly, one should be something of a mimic to reproduce what is heard. 
In April of 1925, he made an expedition to the Bangala country in the unevangelized north, but realized that it was not suitable there for a mission station. He then traveled south to Chitutu between the Songo, Songo and Chokwi tribes and requested permission from the Portuguese authorities to establish a mission station there. He writes about the, the principles he learned, he says, as a result of this first survey of the unevangelized north of Angola. I came to a few sobering conclusions. First, to do any lasting work would be the task of a lifetime. Secondly, it would be a life of isolation. There was not much possibility that the country would be opened up to civilization in our generation. Thirdly, it would mean learning two more languages, Chokwi and Songo. The latter had not yet been committed to writing. And last but not least, it was not a job for a single man. So in 1925, he traveled 300 miles from Holanda to Lumakasai to start learning Chokwi and to visit Elizabeth Smith. While in Portugal, I had met and seen a good deal of Elizabeth Smith of Hartford, Connecticut, who was also interested in pioneer work in virgin territory. Elizabeth seemed to me the ideal of a pioneer among primitive people. She had gone into missionary work of her own volition. We had common ideals and ambitions. I decided to pay Lumakasai a visit and venture to ask her if she would share my life among the Songo people. That meant a walk of 300 miles each way. In between lay the hungry country. The journey from Holanda to Lumakasai in Chokwiland occupied 16 days, but my walk of 600 miles was rewarded. We decided to get married the next year. So in June of 1927, Ernest married Elizabeth. Their honeymoon consisted of a 13-day walk to Chitutu. Before their wedding, Dr. Laura Jacobs had cared for Ernest through numerous bouts of malaria. When he traveled to the wedding, she sent a letter with him to Elizabeth. On opening the doctor's letter, Elizabeth found that she had sent her warm congratulations on our wedding, but added, I'm sorry to tell you that you are marrying this man to bury him, for he is full of malaria. After nearly 40 years, the dying man is still here, and good Dr. Jacobs has long since gone to her reward. Here's a picture of Ernest and Elizabeth on their wedding day. The suit he ordered didn't arrive, and he had to borrow a tweed suit from a man much larger than he was. After settling in Chitutu, they had to learn the Songo language. Ernest was already able to speak Portuguese, Umbundu, and Chokwi, but the Songo language had not yet been committed to writing. He contracted with a man called Mukishi to help him learn Songo. Mukishi spoke Umbundu and Chokwi and had passable Portuguese, though he himself was illiterate. There were no professing Christians among the Songo, and they were suspicious, so the work started with Chokwi villages nearby. In March of 1928, they traveled to Lumakasai for the birth of their first son, David. Dr. Jacobs delivered the baby with the help of Susan McRae, a nurse. There were complications, but these skilled medical workers saved Elizabeth's life. Later that year, in November 1928, Elizabeth came down with blackwater fever. God graciously intervened in answer to their prayers, and they were able to transport her on a hammock to a mission station where Dr. Jacobs nursed her back to health. In 1929 and 1930, they were advised to go back because of their health uh, for a period of furlough. Uh, when they returned in 1932, my father Tom was born, and in 1934, my aunt Anne was born. Here's a picture of the young family and uh, the family a few years later. Uh, another furlough followed in 1937 and 1938, and then in 1940, they moved to Kapango in BA, in that central part of the country, to work among the Umbundu-speaking people. During the years in Kapango, they focused on small regional Bible schools to strengthen the local believers. They also made regular trips to encourage and strengthen local assemblies, not only those planted by missionaries, but also those that had been started by African evangelists. During the next 20 years, he made extensive travels not only in Angola, but also to what is now Zambia and Zimbabwe, and as far south as Cape Town in South Africa. Let me recommend for you as well, uh, my brother has put together a website, tearnestwilson.com, uh, that has uh, articles and books by my grandfather, messages that he wrote, but also very helpfully some letters uh, that he wrote during that time, particularly letters that were sent uh, to echoes of service.
Here's an excerpt from a letter in 1955. Last night, Brother Shorten, Charlie Shorten, and I got back from a trip to a place called Katapi, about halfway between B.A. and Chokwiland, and in the heart of what we used to call the Hungry Country. A remarkable work is going on there. It was started and is being carried on by two Chokwi brethren called Kusindala and Kompandia. When I went there for the first time last year, there was an assembly with about 60 in fellowship. This time we found the assembly had increased to 80, and a large crowd of about 500 were waiting for us. These came from 13 scattered communities, which have been evangelized by these two brethren. A group of 25 had walked three days to be there. The gospel hall, built by the free, voluntary labor of the believers, was too small, so we had the meetings in a large grass enclosure. There are good prospects of a new assembly being planted at a place called Tatella, opened up by these same two men. They have pushed out into the Lukaze tribe in isolated places where no white missionary has been. Let me bring a final challenge to you as we close. These early pioneer missionaries, like the first century Macedonia believers, first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. They were willing to turn their backs on family and friends, realizing that they may never return. Ernest wrote to Fred Arnott in 1923. He was only 21 years old, but he says, After coming here, I felt very lonely at times as I thought of loved ones I might never see again. But now the Lord has more than made up for that with a realized sense of his own presence. I think never since the Lord saved me have I had as much liberty in secret prayer as now and also the word of God is doubly sweet. It seemed as if when every human prop was taken away, it was only to fall into the everlasting arms. Yes, it is still true that they who trust him wholly find him wholly true. May the Lord raise up another generation of pioneers with a fresh vision to reach this world and to see new assemblies established to the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ.